Welcome everybody to Reclaim Holloway's events at the London Festival of Architecture, where we'll be talking about a women's building for London. So a very warm welcome. These discussions are centered around the plans women's building on the site of Holloway, and they're designed to raise awareness about the current status of the development and to hear from architects, activists and academics on pressing questions of design, legacy and the potential of the site before the plans for the development are formally submitted for planning. My name is Rachel Shoiga. I'm a lecturer in criminology at the University of Kent, and I've been a member of Reclaim Holloway since just after the prison closed in 2016. Today, we are honored to be joined by Sarah Akigbogan of Studio Aki and Women in Architecture, Professor Linda Clark, Clark of the University of Westminster, Dr. Jennifer Turner of the University of Oldenburg, and Sarah Wigglesworth of Sarah, Sarah Wigglesworth Architects. So before we begin the conversation, I want to set out the structure of the event and just do some quick housekeeping. So I'm going to begin with a brief introduction to the site and its importance, where the current development stands and explain what Reclaim Holloway have in mind in advocating for a women's building on the site. And then each of our wonderful speakers will have five minutes or so to introduce themselves and offer some initial reflections. Then I'm going to pose a few more questions on issues of legacy, memory and the potential of the building and the role of architecture in facilitating this. And we'll keep five to 10 minutes for questions at the end. So to begin, Reclaim Holloway is an abolitionist coalition made up of women with lived experience of Holloway, women sectors workers, academics, activists, architects and local residents. When the prison closed in 2016 and this public land went up for sale, we mobilised to make sure that the development is socially just and serves the public and to advocate for an appropriate and meaningful legacy for the prison and the thousands of women who were imprisoned there since 1852. It's an incredibly important site for women's history and for women's rights. Holloway Prison has a very complicated and contradictory history. It was a place of punishment and distress where women were separated from loved ones and held in inadequate and often unhygienic conditions. But largely because of the work of charities and non-state organizations, women also found meaningful support in the prison. So social support, drug and alcohol rehabilitation, psychotherapy, art and creativity, training and employability, and many other services were provided through the prison. After Holloway's closure, which came as a big shock to everyone, those organizations lost their footing and their ability to reach women. But while we mourn the loss of the service, the services provided through the prison, we as a coalition insist that social services should not be provided through the prison system, that they should be provided in the community. So it's important to note at the outset that the criminalization and imprisonment of women is mapped onto structural disadvantage, onto marginalization and institutional racism. And as a society, we seem to have chosen to punish rather than to support. The vast majority of offences, more than 85% of offences committed by women, are non-violent and they're often linked to poverty or to drug addiction. And it's extremely likely that women who have entered the criminal justice system have suffered serious abuse, whether sexual, child, domestic or emotional abuse. Sending women to prison tends to exacerbate pre-existing difficulties and vulnerabilities. Women are made homeless, lose their jobs and often lose custody of their children when they're sent to prison. So for us, the issue is less about how to rehabilitate women and more about mitigating structural disadvantage and supporting women in the community. Which is why we've advocated since the prison's closure for a women's building as an inclusive transformative space of support for women in the community in a non-punitive environment. So we see the potential of the building to be a living legacy for Holloway and the women in prison there and to represent a transformative shift in direction from the criminalization of women to community-based support and addressing structural disadvantage. We recognize that women are vulnerable at different points in their lives and that having consistent, reliable support in the community is crucial. So ours is a much more expansive vision than what's currently being offered by Peabody, the developers of the site and designed by AHAM, their architects. Peabody bought the site in 2018 with a 42 million loan and 39 million grant funding from the mayor's office from the Greater London Authority. So this is public land, 
bought with public money. So we might think about the public as investors in the project. The developers are bound by the council's planning document, which was drafted after public consultation in 2017, and they're bound to provide a base for women's services and a safe place in which multiple services can be accessed in the building. So far, so good. But as we took part in the developers' public consultation events and monitored the plans, we realised that they're not really taking into account community and women's sector's voices. And we began to worry that the developers' vision for the women's building is restrictive and minimal and won't meet expectations. This was confirmed last year when they released their draft master plan for the site. So the building is currently designed as a ground floor of a residential block which for us is an insufficient space to offer a home for women's services or to create a safe space of social support. And one of the main problems for us is that the design seems to be based on inadequate research and insufficient consultation with the women's services who hope to use the building. So at that, I'll stop talking and invite our panel members to introduce themselves and to offer some initial reflections around the question, what does the construction of a women's building housed on the site of HMP Holloway mean for you and for London and the wider UK. So if I can ask Sarah Akebogan to go first, please. Hello, hi. Uh, so firstly, thank you very much for having me. Um, I will uh, share my screen with you now and uh, just start by giving um, a very quick um, introduction to uh, me and my practice, and then I'll talk a little bit about um, my thoughts about Holloway or my initial responses. So, hello, I'm Sarah Akibogan, as you've um, just been told. I'm an architect, I'm also a filmmaker. Um, I'm also a filmmaker and I work a lot with theatre. I'm very interested in women's stories and have been for a long time. And in the context of architecture, I'm also an activist. I'm um, vice chair of women in architecture and um, I do kind of various other things in and around activism within the built environment. So I'm a multidisciplinary practitioner working with lots of things, um, primarily, um, or let's say largely uh, narrative, human narrative. Um, I'm very interested in gender and race. Um, and as I've said, um, do a lot of kind of activism around that. So Holloway, um, I'll start with um, a little bit of an introduction, um, some of which um, may uh, duplicate a little bit of what Rachel's already told you, but this was my way into thinking about this. So thinking about the the, the history of, of the site. Um, so Holloway at its time of closing was the largest women's prison in Europe. Um, it was founded in 1852 with the intention of being a terror to evildoers. Um, it was known locally as the castle and it became female only in 1903, which was coincidentally the same year in which Emmeline Pankhurst founded the suffragette movement. And by the time it closed in 2016, it was the home to some 500 women at any one time. It was the home to 500 women and in a sense, their stories. So my interest in prisons, as I say, um, dates back to a kind of um, previous research interest in the history of confinement and specifically the way architecture is used to contain mental illness. Um, the history of the asylum and the prison are, are in some senses very kind of closely linked. The idea of removing liberty from people um, confining them as a form of punishment dates back to the ancient world and mass confinement became increasingly used as a form of control in western societies from the 18th century onwards so together with the asylum the prison was a way of separating people that were deemed harmful from society and prison with this additional element of punishment replaced even more barbaric practices such as public executions and floggings and so on. But the prison was intended as a more humane system, a form of punishment that allowed for redemption. Um, prison along with the asylum forms 
part of what Foucault called the societies of control, a way of managing people on a, on a grand scale. So both criminals and the mentally ill, um, people who were often kind of perceived as outcast social misfits, uh, or indeed those mm -hmm. who didn't conform, like the suffragette that we see here being force fed, um, people that Lisa Avignance, I've probably mispronounced her name, but so apologies, I'm sure she's not on this call, but apologies to her. Um, but what she, people that she calls the mad, bad and the sad, they were often the poor and powerless. Um, and certainly the poor would see themselves spend longer in prison because they couldn't afford bail. Um, and very frequently there were women who'd fallen into poverty. And today, um, today we see um, increasingly kind of um, numbers of uh, women of color um, also over overrepresented in the penal system. So the relationship between prisons and mental illness is an interesting one. It's shifted over time. But today, some 25% of female inmates have a mental health problem um, and often serious uh, mental health mm. problems, serious mental illnesses such as psychosis, which compares to 15% in the general population. And many should arguably be in a place of safety rather than prison. Um, women find themselves in prison for many reasons. Uh, systemic inequality and the accompanying precarity that goes with that sees many lives spiral into criminal behaviors or behaviors which are increasingly criminalized. So, for example, women can find themselves in prison for something as simple as not paying a council tax bill. And um, as I've said, women often find themselves in prison for refusing to conform. And the suffragettes are, of course, some of Holloway's most famous inmates and uh, an example of this. So prisons, uh, in my view, hide, hide society's failings. Um, they, they hide society's failings and and the kind of, um, let's say, our failure to protect people. They swallow up people who fall through the cracks and are often black holes where people are lost rather than redeemed. So. This prison closed in 2016 as part of the government's wider plan to replace uh, Victorian prisons and um, kind of uh, move prisons to the outskirts of, of, um, of, of the city. Um, now, 2016 was also the same year in which uh, Sarah Reed, uh, coincidentally the same year in which Sarah Reed, a mixed race woman, Suffer, who's, who suffered from paranoid schizophrenia would die in this prison. She was found hanging in her cell and in many ways her life typifies those that we fight that fall into the criminal justice system. And following an inquiry into her death, Deborah Coles of Inquest said, Sarah Reed was a woman in torment, imprisoned for the sake of two medical assessments to confirm what was resoundingly clear that she needed specialist medical care, not prison. Her death was a result of multi-agency failures to protect a woman in crisis instead of providing her with adequate support. The prison treated her mental, her ill, her Ill mental health as a discipline and control issue rather than containment issue. So women often find themselves in prison because of precarity, but the, the women's building offers, in my view, an opportunity Firstly, to remember the history it represents, which is a valuable social history um, and one that we can learn from. It's an opportunity to tell the stories of women that once lived here. It's an opportunity to offer support rather than punishment and to support um, and to support and foster um, community and social change. It could um, give rather than take in the form of educational programs and extension of family networks. Um, and uh, the reason I show uh, I showed this image is because I believe that it's a, in this building we have an opportunity to learn from matriarchal societies and that we should be um, kind of uh, use, utilizing those within the design process. Um, so. 
the women's building in my view should be should represent an inversion of everything that prison stands for um it could be an exemplar of co-design it could be uh, if, if it were allowed to and it should feature a strong representation of female voices we should or could utilize existing fragments of the uh, fragments of the existing building and i suppose a kind of um overarching vision um beyond kind of offering support rather than punishment which i've talked about would be that this might be a kind of modern female friendly society and uh, and hopefully a place of safety so those are my thoughts i'll stop sharing um hopefully i haven't overrun too much i wasn't watching the time don't worry at all sarah that was really wonderful thank you very much and such a gorgeous selection of images as well thank you um so next we'll hear from professor linda clark if that's okay on the question of i'll just remind you what does the construction of the women's building on this site mean for you well, thank you very much for um, allowing me to take part. I'm, I, it's, you've already said that I'm at the University of Westminster. I'm also co-director of the Centre for the Study of the Production of the Built Environment there. And I've done lots of research over many years on women in construction. Um, and also I live up the road from the prison. So I'm a local resident. Um, so I'm going to really talk about the the next 10 years almost, which is when the construction process goes on. Um, and I'll share my screen with, I've just got a few slides. So I'm going to talk about ensuring inclusive and quality low energy construction training and employment on the site. Um, really about embedding climate action into the site and also making sure that women play a very big role. And I should just to present a context at the moment, um, the challenges confronting the redevelopment are firstly, the uh, local council Islington has declared a climate emergency, aiming to be net zero carbon by 2030. Um, and at the same time, we have a construction industry, which is really very problematic. It has over 2 million workers altogether in Britain. Um, it, extremely bad in terms of end use carbon emissions often poor working conditions, 50% of the workforce self-employed, 97% of firms, SMEs or micro firms, very severe skill shortage and absolute crisis in training, employer disengagement uh, really from training and vocational education, and at the same time, a lack of vocational education and training for zero energy building. So big problems and we're, really trying to focus on the site as a way to try and address some of these problems and at the same time and in particular to overcome the the real big problem of the industry its exclusiveness uh, women have always been excluded for many centuries really um, at the moment there are only 10 percent of managers and professionals are women more in the technical occupations which is interesting in terms of low energy construction but only three percent in the skilled um, trade occupations. Now, fortunately, the council and the Greater London Authority are required to, to, they, to are allowed to make various requirements in terms of training and employment on the site to stipulate on-site opportunities for residents, work placements, um, and working with the council's employment service, and in particular for training include and there's a, actually a ratio of this of, of proper of training allowed which is about one trainee per 20 residential units for the for the whole site and i'm and i include both the housing and the women's building in that um we should be able to have 45 to 50 trainees on the site as well as those on work placements and local job opportunities um they're also allowed to uh, stipulate contributions to support initiatives tackling worklessness and to set certain procurement obligations, for instance, setting um, conditions for subcontractors such as diversity track records. Um, the Greater London Authority also has certain requirements, um, co particularly coordinating with initiatives for inclusive access to training and employment 
requiring development proposals to support employment and training opportunities, and in particular, increasing the proportion of underrepresented groups. So this sets quite a good context in a way to really try and set very firm conditions um, for the whole site. And at the same time, of course, we need to honor the historical legacy of the site with respect to women, conform to the council's climate emergency strategy, including community energy schemes and work with local groups through co-production consultation process. So that's to set the context, the proposals we've put forward as a campaign, and that, that I'm talking about the um, community plan for Holloway campaign, um, are that we have, we would we want to see quality training within a recognized framework to at least level three qualifications, um, given the very skilled nature of construction work and the need to ensure a future for young people. Um, and at the same time, we have a lengthy construction process. So this allows for proper training for um, young people on this. And also, of course, we need to ensure energy literacy, not just for trainees, but for all workers on the site. And in particular, our proposal is for a high proportion of women to be employed on the whole site, um, and in particular on the women's building, um, at least 30% of women to be employed and at least 50% to be trained, including, of course, ex-prisoners. Um, we want to make sure that there's good employment and working condition, especially direct employment and in conformity with Unite the Union's construction charter to set aside part of the site. And for this, it could be the women's building, specifically for training purposes, which is a much more efficient way of training and promoting the site as an example of how construction can be transformed into an inclusive eco industry. So just to sum up uh, what we've done so far, we've been talking to people in London Square who've generally welcomed the proposals, um, talking to the council, both with the councillors and officers who have also and, and really discussing regularly with them about how to take the proposals forward, talking with the Greater London um, Authority and with various officers there who are um, responsible for green skills and the construction, with further education colleges and with Unite, Un the Union on realising the training and employment needed, and above all, with women in construction groups, discussions in particular with women into construction, the photo there is from women into construction and with trades with the, the United States trades women building bridges who are now planning um, to come over with a large delegation next June and who will be uh, of which a couple of women from there will be speaking at the event on the 28th so I would recommend you attend then so um, with 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 that I'll I'll finish um, and come out of my share screening there we are. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, and just to clarify for people who might not know, Reclaim Holloway have kind of been part of a broader coalition called the Community Plan for Holloway, which represents a lot more groups as well as local residents. Um, so we're lucky enough to have both Linda and Sarah Wigglesworth as part of that collective. Um, okay, so Jennifer Turner, please, Dr. Jennifer Turner, if you'd be happy to Hello, thanks so much, Rachel, and to your colleagues at Reclaim Holloway for having me here today to, to join this panel. Um, I am a human geographer, and I'm based at the University of Oldenburg in Germany. And I'm really interested in Holloway as a site in terms of what it can do for the legacies and ongoing trajectory of the symbols and messages that, that our spaces and societies of, of incarceration um, in what, what that legacy is and how it's enforced through, through the architecture. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a human geographer and in recent years I've been really interested in the architectural spaces of incarceration. Um, most recently thinking through the physical spaces of a prison um, with my colleagues Dominique Moran and Yvonne Jukes, who I believe is in the programme um, for these talks in the upcoming weeks. So do tune into that to, to hear her take on those kind of things. But I've been really interested in thinking about the landscape of imprisonment and what the, the kind of aesthetic messages can, can tell us in terms of the landscape and, and, and a punitive philosophy, philosophy of the justice sector. 
specifically thinking through things like microarchitecture and you know, the spaces of the prison, such as the prison cell. But grounded within all that is, is a kind of ongoing interest in the prison boundary and how we have a relationship with prisons as for the most part, people who don't um, engage with that, that particular space in our everyday lives. And so one of the things that has drawn my interest in recent years is thinking about what happens to prisons after they no longer um, continue as prison spaces, as one kind of relationship across and beyond this prison boundary. And so a lot of my work has been focusing on things like prison tourism and the transformation of old prison architecture. Now, if we were in a room, I would ask you perhaps to raise your hand if you've, if you've had the, I'll say, joy or opportunity to visit this particular prison, um, which is the former HMP Oxford, which is now a Malmaison hotel. And this particular prison site is quite interesting because it, it does represent one of many attempts to reuse prison landscapes. And we often see these landscapes, landscapes reused as, for example, hotels or museums, um, other kind of spaces, largely along the lines of leisure and entertainment. Now, I'm not showing these images because I understand that the Holloway site is trying to do the same thing, but I think it helps us to think through questions around heritage, education, and then possibly where the gray area is about reusing these sites in a particular way to often promote leisure or entertainment. So for Holloway, we, we see a transformation of, of the, the site into predominantly proposed housing. Um, but I do understand from the proposals, we're also attempting to retain the legacy of Holloway, whatever that means and perhaps also to, to do some kind of educational museum exhibitions with uh, purposes to kind of, to perhaps to educate people who are interested in this site's history. So for me, this all raises questions of, of what, if anything, we should retain in terms of the legacy of incarceration and whether the architecture of the site plays a role in that. You know, and how can we balance a situation where for the most part, we are hoping that these spaces do meaningful heritage and educational purposes but sometimes um, for, and for some people they act as spaces of perhaps voyeurism or entertainment um, and just to show you a few images going forward I mean something like the Malmaison in Oxford is really interesting because here we see a literal retaining of the prison infrastructure and it is very much and, and self overtly used to spectacularize certain aspects of life which the paying public would be interested in seeing and of course, oftentimes we see very much the physical infrastructure of prison being retained in its former glory, so to speak. We see uh, very much concrete materiality enforced in the current landscape. And that's not something that I don't think we'll see too much of um, at the Holloway site. And it's not often, um, this is Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. Again, I don't know if anyone's ever into this but here we don't see a transformation of a prison site into a luxury hotel but we do see the retention of these architectural spaces which clearly sends a message to say this was a prison this was used at one time for bad or good and you know it's there and in our faces for all to see often we see these spaces transformed into prison museums purposefully created cells set in time to mark a particular trajectory of that prison's history. I know that that is perhaps proposed here within a small exhibition in the women's, the women's building as well. And you know, I've got lots to say about whether the creation of a static prison cell exhibit is something that accurately reflects the multifarious and diverse and problematic tension filled experiences of, of every person who's ever been in that prison. We also see these spectacularization of things like weaponry and, and uh, contraband that somehow are supposed to memorialize all aspects of prison life. But we might raise the question of, of how far these things do do the role of educating people about the, 
prison experience or whether they are there for entertainment and spectacularizing purposes. We also often see um, living museums or, or performance-led um, penal heritage where we're supposed to take on the role of prisoners. This is the Galleries of Justice um, in Nottingham. And here, when you enter, you're given a convict number and you follow your, your own convict history to see what becomes of you as you, as you go through, the, through these prison museums. Again, all of these perhaps not suggested for the Holloway site, but I think they're really interesting to unpick and unpack the problems that often ensue when we start to, to, to think about doing good things such as instilling legacy or holding on to the heritage of a prison site. And at what point do we start to tip over into a situation of voyeurism or spectacle or even too much fun? Does that ever undermine the legacies of the people who actually spent time in those spaces? Too much to say in this short time, but what does this mean for Holloway? I think I'm particularly interested in the Peabody's plans to, um, to rethink the entrance to the women's building and to harness what they say is a symbol of the prison wall. So for me, Holloway, I think, is an interesting opportunity. I think we do have to consider the legacy, the architectural legacy of the prison, to think carefully about the prison wall, for example. As we know from the residents on this panel, um, Holloway Prison is very much entrenched within the social history of this site. And is it important to retain that? Yes, I think it is. But at the same time, I think that entrance wall sets a really interesting tra trajectory because for me, it's a really important opportunity. It's key for highlighting the his histories and geographies of imprisonment, not just for women, but across um, the wider UK. It's important for symbolizing the social history in an area. But for me, as a scholar of the prison boundary, this entrance wall is really intriguing because it's an entrance, a crossing point, an opportunity to bridge, not just inside and outside of prison, old and new, to take away from the old legacies of criminal justice, bad or good, and to think through a new future trajectory for this women's building and what that represents. So the building itself can be a crossing point and perhaps a far more powerful symbol um, of an effective criminal justice system than the original prison ever was. So a few ideas there. Um, thank you so much um, for letting me share some thoughts. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Um, yeah, I was really struck by just the authorship of those kind of spaces, those museum spaces, you know, speaking about cunning prisoners and the kind of person that is constructed through those tours. Um, yeah, thank you. Loads to think about there. Um, and finally, to our final speaker, um, Sarah Wigglesworth, please take the floor. Thank you very much. And um... Thank you very much for inviting me here tonight uh, to this um, inaugural one of four. Um, my interest in this is really um, as a feminist architect and a local who uh, whose living and working environment is actually located halfway between Holloway and Pentonville prisons. And uh, for who we did a, um, a speculative project for Pentonville when it was announced that these this prison estate was going to get um, sold. Um, that caused us to think really hard about what it is that you might be able to do with a with a prison such as Holloway, which is actually happening. And um, so I put this talk together, which actually builds really well on what Jen Turner has just said, because I'm going to talk about what might be possible for a women's building um, as an architect, actually. What, what sort of things are you talking about that might... Um, lead to a more perhaps redemptive offer. So the site of Holloway Prison as it is at the moment it is really derelict and unkempt and undoubtedly kind of speaks now very very eloquently about the kind of sad history of incarceration and to my mind incarceration is something which is really a kind of solution invented for violent men applied to women and rather sort of indiscriminately um, 
sort of transferred to a different, a very different population with very different reasons for going into jail, as has already been outlined. And by the way, some of what I'm going to say sort of picks up on quite a lot of what's been said already, so I'm not going to repeat it, but it does echo quite a lot of that. Um, I think the other thing to say is that, you know, despite the very, very sincere um, intentions of the people who designed this building, RMJM, and the, um, the then um, head of the prison at the time, uh, who had sort of uh, pushed very hard to commission this new building, um, and whose intentions was to make a much more kind of benign environment to replace the castellated um, prison that you saw earlier, um, it, it has really uh, reinforced the idea of punishment. However, it does contain uh, a series of, uh, hang on, a series of clustered cells. Oh yeah, there's the old prison. A series of cluster cells, which are actually based on the idea of uh, sort of blocks of flats and actually wouldn't, you know, it, passing site wouldn't be that much different from some places we all know. Um, it has a swimming pool, which is now a redundant uh, item, and it also had a gym. Um, and it also had quite a lot of sort of green outdoor space on a hill, and it wasn't sort of all altogether absolutely unremittingly awful. And these are the sort of starting points that you might look at if you're thinking about what might you do with this existing building. However, as I said, if this was intended to rehabilitate, um, I think you know every aspect of it really shows a massive lack of care and sort of the return to the idea of punishment. And so to my mind, this raises a really interesting issue about, um, you know, what, what is a prison and particularly in, in the case of this prison, how can it be recorded in its sort of manifestation? How can it be memorialized and how can its physicality somehow be captured in a manner which is both sort of authentic in rendering it, i.e. not a uh, Disneyland, but also which is critical and possibly even redemptive. So my answer to this has sort of three dimensions really, and they are the, the, pra the, the practical, the physical, and the symbolic. And so to talk about the practical for a moment, I think the building, as has been already said, should you know, provide support for women and help them live safe, secure, and financially independent and fulfilling lives. I mean, it sort of goes without saying. And that could involve training, work opportunities, Linda's talked about that, services offering support and solidarity, knowledge sharing, education, counseling, consciousness raising, confidence building and therapy, um, skills sharing, creative spaces, workspaces for entrepreneurs, networking, startups, it should be women-led mentoring as part of the package. Rachel's talked a bit about that already, but also women should be designing and building this building. And that touches on what Linda's already said. Um, it would empower and skill up a generation of construction professionals and show that construction is a viable and even an attractive occupation for women and girls. Um, it goes without saying that women should run and manage the building, finding new forms of association and organizational structures that work for them. And in my view, uh, issues of leadership and what that means for women should be rethought and the structures um, could, should be network rather than hierarchical and risk should be embraced in order that the organization can, should grow and nurture a proud and confident and wise leadership. Um, physically, the prison still exists in its original form, as uh, I saw on this visit. Um, it embodies the literal space and material form of prison life, as you see there. Um, so it would be a gift to the project to retain at least part of it in a structure as a reminder of what life was like there, to which no one wants to return. This need not be a literal retention, in fact it definitely shouldn't. The space standards of a cell, for example, or the relationship of a window to a bed to a basin could be faithfully recre recreated or inscribed in other ways, for example, as a garden or a sculpture. To do this, I think, could be profoundly moving and poignant. In addition, the extant fabric also represents a vast quantity of material, brick, concrete, windows, plant, metal work, and so on, 
all of which will have to somehow be disposed of or redeployed. And in view of the climate crisis, it represents a huge amount of embodied carbon, which should not be squandered without careful thought about its eventual destination. And I think there's a sort of subtle additional point to this, which is that we all know that uh, the poorest uh, in, the, in our societies are going to come off worse from climate change. And that very, very often means women. So actually taking that issue on board and addressing it as a really uh, sort of fundamental plank behind the equity that lies at the heart of this project, I think it's really important. So at the very least, these materials should be salvaged and reused in a new building or in a landscape, but representing as they do the embodiment of the former walls of incarceration. And I think that could, in, could signify a redemptive scenario that that seeks to liberate women rather than oppress them. So this brings me to my final dimension, which is the symbolic. Buildings convey, convey implicit messages through their appearance, scale and sighting. So in terms of what the building could symbolize physically, the celebrated wavy walls, here we go, um, that uh, sit around the site are a really powerful symbol, just as the Berlin Wall was. And it could be deliberately deconstructed or rehabilitated as an element in the landscaping or of the new complex. I think the women's building itself should be flexible spatially and it should privilege the tactile above the visual and it should promote a sense of pleasure and joy, things that we often don't really talk about in architecture. It should signal openness and welcome while incorporating the capacity for privacy and it should very much avoid crude and reductionist cliches such as being colored red, think of menstruation immediately, or using curvaceous forms that reference the hackneyed ideas about the female body, or be confined to some sort of domestic scale. And the reason is that these tactics condemn women to be in thrall either to their biology or to the sites that have for centuries confined their agency. So in my opinion, they're completely inappropriate. Nonetheless, while memorialising the era of the prison, the building should have a clear identity of its own. It should have the dignity and gravitas, but it should be non-institutional, avoiding all the tropes of power, authority and patriarchal systems. It should have a sense of scale, but not be overbearing and self-important. It should be radical, exciting, uplifting and aspirational. It deserves to soar and break free from the structures that have bound women in the past, and that includes the current design of which it's sort of shoehorned in. A standalone building would be the perfect way to symbolize women's power to exist independently of oppressive patriarchal powers or the dependency on others to, of their goodwill and labor. But each of the other components I've already mentioned need putting in place too. Fundamentally, women must be given the opportunity to shape this place to their own desires and needs. And in particular, where am I? <laughs> and in particular, uh, yes, this means rejecting the paternalistic manner in which the procurement and communication about the current design is taking place. True engagement with women would be the first tactic in a strategy for liberation, and this is the hardest aspect to achieve, but in my mind it's absolutely essential if the building is to create a worthy second, uh, worthy second setting in which women can thrive. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that. That was um, a real call to arms. <laughs> much appreciated. Um, so we have a few minutes left for questions. If anybody has any questions, please do pop them into the chat and we can put them to the panel. Um, and while you're thinking, um, I might just ask, I think Sarah has kind of already addressed this in what she just said, but maybe the other panelists can offer some reflections on what role architectural expression could play in amplifying the transformative potential of a women's building. So what might the design principles be that would draw out that transformative potential. Who would like to for you, Sarah Akibogan? <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm the, I'm the only other architect and always the other Sarah. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm going to echo some of the things that have already been said. So I, I found Sarah, other, other Sarah, I'm always saying this, but um, other Sarah's um, um, 
talk very interesting and also Jen's. So um, just kind of thinking about what we can do w with symbols and, and what they mean and kind of, um, but also I think um, commu the communication process that Sarah was just talking about is, is really important. Um, it's so, I think that the profession of architecture is so kind of um, bound up with these communication processes that are very patriarchal. And, and I think that a project like this um, absolutely calls for us to kind of, um, you know, rethink that um, and, and calls for new processes. Um, personally, I'm really interested in the sort of storytelling aspect of something like this. So where kind of storytelling meets materiality and I think that we, you know, absolutely need to take our um, cue from women um, to think about how, how we do that. Um, so that's kind of, kind of a waffly answer. But I think, I think um, my understanding of where this project has fit, I mean, multi, it's kind of failed at sort of multiple, uh, in multiple ways so far from um, the perspective of of architecture and how the architecture is being, um, um, let's say, imposed, and uh, yeah, I, th I think it's it is about rethinking, rethinking the entire process actually. And if anything, this is a project um, where I think um, there there is license to do that. So, <laughs> great, thank you very much, Linda. Do you have something to offer? Well, I mean, I have to say, I see architecture is very much part of the whole construction process and for me this would be a wonderful opportunity to break down this awful division between the manual aspects of control what is called although it's most of it is highly skilled abstract work um, um, and and the professions and I think that's actually essential that they all work together and that women at a whether it's in relation to the design, the construction, um, should all be involved and work together on this um, and try and break down some of these awful divisions that we still see in this country. Fantastic, thank you. Um, there is a question that has come through, uh, a couple of questions, one that I can answer myself from a kind of Reclaim Holloway perspective. So there's a question about how in the past this prison excluded trans women um, who haven't had sex reassignment surgery and how would this new scheme cater for trans women and gender non-binary people. It's always been Reclaim, Reclaim Holloway's position that this would be a very inclusive building. Um, but we don't have much control over what the building will be in its final iteration. That'll be up to the governing body who takes over the running of the building. But we are advocating for a very inclusive building. Um, the other question that I wanted to pose to the panelists comes from Mark, uh, which is kind of an advocacy question, I guess. How do we make this the national issue it deserves to be? Um, I, I, I can jump in very, very, very quickly. Um, and, and again, I think it is about this, this thing of um, communication. But I think you're doing a great job already, I think, um, you know, by, by setting up this series of talks. Um, and, but again, I, I'm going to say something that might sound very naive, but I do think it is, I think it is um, again, about storytelling and communication um, and just about engaging as many people in that conversation as possible um so those are my kind of very light thoughts that's great thank you yeah jennifer please yeah thanks it's a really interesting question it's almost a, a question too difficult to answer in the short time that we that we've got available but the thing that's that struck me when i was looking through the wider history of, of the site and its development is the the rationale for the sale um, of the site and the, the, the indication that the women's building, for example, should provide like for like services that were offered on the former HMP Holloway site. And the fact that, at least to my, in my impression of it, that perhaps the Ministry of Justice, excuse me, have been allowed perhaps to get a little, to get away with passing the responsibility 
ability for delivering those services and delivering the space for those services um, to, a, to a third party. And I think perhaps there could be slightly more um, emphasis on the kind of hand washing that's happened there in terms of the disappearance of, of these key sites in relation to petitioning perhaps for more, um, more funding from either um, the mayor's, you know, the mayor's council or a wider ministry of justice funding because um, that, you know, previously some of those services were paid for and run for, run by the ministry of justice. And I think that they've, yeah, they've washed their hands a little bit. And I think that could perhaps be more widely um, petitioned against. Uh, thank you very much. And I think it's worth noting as well that a lot of women's organisations who did work through Holloway have been um, really put under pressure, under austerity, and especially with London Rent, trying to find sustainable homes for the organisations that they run that provide essential services for women, which were taken away when the prison closed. Okay, great. Um, it's coming up on five two, and I want to leave a bit of time for the... Um, just to conclude, but there's one quick question for Linda. Um, are there any training schemes already to, sorry, are there any training programs ready to support women's training and employment on the Holloway site? And is there any funding to help fund or scale up such a program? Well, that's, um, that I've already said, there's, there's really quite a degree of um, crisis in the industry and especially and for training for the industry. There is, of course, and so that's why we've been talking to the further education colleges really about the possibility and the council of building up these training programs. And I mean, of course, the obligations that I spoke about um, require um, from different parties that they put funding into the training. And um, as long as we keep a very watchful eye, which I'm sure we will, what goes on, we can try and ensure that we have the best possible solutions. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, and would each of the other speakers maybe like to reflect just, uh, this is a bit of a leading question, but if you'll allow me, <laughs> um, whether you think the current proposals, uh, which is one block, uh, one floor under a residential block, if that seems to you to be sufficient to honour the legacy of this building. I don't mind starting. Um, I don't think it is at all. And I'm really, really disappointed to see what is coming forward in it at the moment. And I don't I don't mind just saying that out in public because that's my view. And um, I must say, I think it's very problematic the way this whole uh, uh, project and the process has been kind of conducted and I think it's so um, conditional on the way that our government uh, runs um, and sort of ma and, and, and procurement is managed in our society and I think you know it's we're between a government who wants to sort of sell off its uh, its estate to the highest bidder and then where social housing has to be provided by um, effectively developers, albeit in this case with a huge grant, where the kind of the council desperately want ho new um, social homes, but actually have very little teeth, despite the fact that they've got planning policy and various documents that are meant to describe what should be happening. In the end, the money talks and the community is not really listened to. And I feel that it's all around the wrong way. And actually, I, I think the kind of adversarial nature of the way that it's all conducted is incredibly unhelpful, ultimately. And if we could find a better way, even within the parameters and the kind of coordinates that I've already outlined of where development can take place within these very, very difficult conditions, which I must say I hope don't last and can change eventually, um, that there should be space for actually everybody to work together. And I cannot for the life of me understand why that's not happening. And all of this energy and all of this passion and all of this knowledge is not being tapped into. I absolutely can't understand why not. 
You and me both. Thank you, Sarah. We're running out of time, but if Linda, the other Sarah and Jen would offer uh, just 30 seconds, that would be great. And I've just popped in the chat rather than taking up more space myself, just the website for Reclaim Holloway and the asks or demands that we're putting forward to the developer and to the council. I think it's, of course it's insufficient and we should really be pressing for, you know, a real facilities for women across, well, locally and across London and even nationally. And I hope everybody here is going to shout loud and clearly that that's what we all want and they could also hopefully tell everyone that that's what it's going to be because we just won't accept anything else thank you um yeah well i mean i can only echo i think um it, it's obviously extremely disappointing um that this is kind of you know it, it seems to me like a, an, another example of the marginalization of women's women's needs but also kind of of women in the construction process in the and in the procurement process um so again i, I can only echo what everyone has said but um you know ab absolutely not um it's not you know this isn't sufficient and uh for me it's kind of indicative of the way our cities are are made in general um and something that we need a big rethink around If I may, I'm, I, I don't really want to have the last word on such an important topic, but um, I think the short answer is um, I think we could do more. I think there is more, you know, there is more to say on this. You know, on the one hand, one subject we haven't touched on is that this will be a predominantly residential site. And we can't forget that over these many decades from since 1852, Holloway has been a home and a place of residence for many people. Um, and it would be nice to petition to see if some of this affordable housing could perhaps ch ch chime into this legacy of care for particularly women or people who identify as women. That would be an interesting strategy. I'm also really pleased to hear from, for example, Sarah's, Sarah Rugowitz's ideas about dynamic ways to deal with heritage and legacy, because I think that space is going to be a pre at a premium at this site. And I think that we can be inventive. I think that they're going to be squashed, space is going to be squashed, money is going to be squashed, but I think that there can be hopeful ways to make prog progress against this, um, even in the face of such challenging stringencies and economies. So maybe I'll end on that little positive thought that I think something good will emerge, but I think it'll be hard work. Amazing. Thank you very much. I think innovative, creative, transformative, hopeful. These are all the words that we're trying to summon um, through the campaign and use them to try to convince uh, the council and Peabody to give women what they deserve through this site. OK, so we're just over eight o'clock. Uh, thank you so much to all our wonderful speakers today. Uh, we really appreciate you coming and to share your thoughts. And um, thank you to all the attendees who came. Um, we will save the chat uh, in terms of the questions that have been asked that we didn't get a chance to discuss and we'll think about them and also bring them into our conversations with the developers and the council because I think there's some fantastic points being made there. Okay, so we'll leave it there for tonight. Thank you all for attending. <laughs>